Good morning, everybody. First, uh, I would like to thank uh, Geoscience BC for supporting the porphyry indicator mineral PIMS uh, during the last few years. Uh, this work is presented by myself and uh, the co-author for this uh, presentation, Craig Hart and Thomas Bissig from MDRU. Antonio Solis just recently finished his master thesis on PIMS, largely working on titanite. I will show some of his work. And Travis Ferby from BCGS uh, collaborated with us on uh, basically identifying various type of tilts. As it, as it was mentioned by uh, uh, a few presenters before, the main, one of the main challenges in exploration around the world is exploring deposit under cover. And that's the case in pretty much everywhere in the world, including the BC. And this is a picture of the uh, southern part of the wood jam area and shows a large area covered by till. And the main challenge is that exploration for porphyry deposit has been very successful using and studying alteration minerals, such as biotite, clays, sericite, potassium feldespar, all these minerals and veins. Uh, but more, more, pretty much all those information has been lost uh, when you are looking at tills. None of those minerals exist as a result of weathering and uh, all these processes, none of those minerals are preserved. So the main challenge for exploration is that if we, if we can find a, 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 a mineralogical link uh, in till sediments, that we can directly relate that to the porphyry deposits. So are there any minerals that we can identify in these, sed in these sediments uh, so that's, that's basically is the main idea for exploring uh, uh, on, uh, in, for covered deposits. So if we can find those indicator minerals, we can use them for exploration because we know that this, pro, this, pro, this uh, uh, method has been successfully used for kimberlite exploration. And uh, in kimberlite, as you know, they use various type of indicator mirror to explore for kimberlite. And porphyry deposits have pretty much the same thing. This picture at top shows a kimberlite pipe, and at the bottom, it shows a porphyry system. And you can see that the mm, porphyry intrusive complex is pretty much the same size or even a little bit larger than a typical kimberlite, but the ore body and alteration around the porphyry are significantly larger than kimberlite. So there is, in terms of size, these are pretty much bigger systems than, than kimberlite. And there are a wide varieties of resistant minerals that occur in porphyry deposit. And these could be apatite, rutol, zircon, various type of these minerals. The, the difficulty is that it's, it's, these minerals are not usually well characterized. And the link between various types of these minerals to the porphyry are not very well studied, even though they usually occur as accessory minerals. So the challenge for us was to characterize these minerals in order to, to make these resistant minerals indicator for porphyry deposit. So that was the main focus of our project, to look at these minerals and characterize them and provide the link to the porphyry deposits. So these minerals have been known for a long. For example, rutile is a very common uh, mineral in porphyry deposit, and red rutile has been described. And even some of the earliest studies of rutile, because there is so much rutile in porphyry deposit, and some of the early workers like uh, Sidney Williams and Zamensky and others from USGS even suggested that rutile, uh, the porphyry deposit can be mined for titanium because there is so much of rutile in porphyry deposits. And some of the other works that have been done on porphyry, on rutile, for example, uh, this work uh, by Scott in the New Saltwells, in the porphyry deposit in New Saltwells, that shows that the 
that uh, the rutile in porphyry deposit has a specific chemical characteristics. And uh, as it shows here, the, the contour line shows that as you get closer to the porphyry deposit, the vanadium content of the root, rutile, become higher. So they were using this, suggesting to use the rutile, the vanadium content, and other trace elements in rutile as an indicator to vector the drilling towards the center of the porphyry. Apatite is another one, and fluorescence in apatite has been uh, known for a long in porphyry deposit. I will talk about about apatite. Other minerals like garnet have been characterized in porphyry uh, deposit. They have a specific zoning and some sort of dissolution. Uh, other minerals like zircon also have been described. Rose zircon has been documented. And a lot of the studies on zircon have been focused on the fertility of the porphyry intrusive system, similar to monazite and titanite. I will talk about a little bit our work on titanite and blonde titanite has been uh, characterized in porphyry deposits. Some of the other minerals, tourmaline, have been described more recently a lot, have some work on tourmaline. Other minerals such, such as jarosite and a lot of copper oxide could be used as indicator minerals and last but not least, uh, magnetite and other iron oxide, with all, which I will touch base on them as well. So for the porphyry indicator minerals, we basically looked at a few uh, porphyry deposits in BC, both alkalic and calcalkalic, such as Copper Mountain, Highland Valley, Mount Pauli, Indaco, and uh, Huckleberry, and uh, uh, Mount Milligan, and we collected the, the uh, samples from various type of alteration phases, and as, as well as some unmineralized luck to basically to characterize these indicator minerals. And apatite was one of the first mineral that we looked. Apatite is an interesting mineral because it has an in, in, interesting chemical structure that can incorporate a lot of trace elements. And uh, those can be used basically to map or trace evidence of alteration and mineralization. And the other important thing with apatite, as you can see in the picture here, there are two grains of apatite under normal polarized light. It's, it's a, little, a, a little bit hard to see them, but apatite has a great uh, cathodal luminescence. So when we use cathodal luminescence techniques, you can much better and easier see the apatite, and I will show in the next few slides, mm, greater uh, uh, greater, better characterization on appetite of appetite texture. So this is how appetite looks like under the CL. You can see various, uh, usually in the felsic rock has this yellow luminescence uh, color. And sometimes it could be like the other picture on the right side could have a little brownish uh, color, but it's, it's very characteristic and homogeneous color and sometimes, as you can see, it shows, it shows zoning. And the picture on the bottom side, you can see sometimes it shows zoning with changes from uh, yellow to has some sort of darker grayish uh, brownish bands. And those bands are interesting. And uh, we are currently studying these texture in appetite as a as a index for fertility. For example, you can see the picture on the bottom is a zoned appetite which has a core with brownish luminescence surrounded by more greenish to yellowish luminescence. And when we analyze this thing, we realize that these uh, brownish, more brownish luminescence core, they have more rarer elements and they are more sulfur rich. And the picture on the top shows that sometimes they become repeated. For example, it has a core which has more brownish, more sulfurish, uh, and then it has a band or zone which is strongly sulfur and rarely rich and surrounded by a ring which is more uh, sulfur poor. And this has been attributed to the change in the sulfate 
uh, evolution of the magma. So the magma was originally sulfate rich and then become sulfate poor as a result of crystallization of anhydrite. And other processes such as magma mixing also contributed to that. So this is how apatite looks like in, uh, in uh, uh, ultra, ultra rock. You can see the apatite in the picture on the uh, left has a green luminescent overgrowth. And on the right, you can see the apatite has uh, more greenish luminescence. And that greenish luminescence is as a result of K-silicate alteration. And it's, it's been cut by a gray luminescence, and that's a result of uh, overprinting filic alteration, which is better shown on this picture. And you can see the apatite. Basically, the luminescence as of apatite has been basically destroyed, and you can see remnant of the uh, greenish and yellowish luminescence overprinted by grayish luminescence. And this is an apatite grain, almost 200, 300 micron. And you can see a tiny fracture going, cutting through the apatite. And there is, in fact, a little bit calcopyrite deposited along that apatite. So this apatite is pretty much, for exploration geologists, has the same value of looking at a rock of porphyry cutting by a phallic alteration with sulfide. So everything you can see in that hand sample, you can actually see in this piece of grain. And basically, it's the same process, same thing, except that that rock sample didn't preserve in the till, but you can pick up this uh, appetite grain from till sediment and know that it's coming from a porphyry. And that's the key message here. So we did some geochemistry as well. So the, uh, these, uh, the geochemistry supports that uh, textural variation that we see in till sediment, for example, mm -hmm. Various colors shows yellow is the unaltered apatite, green is the casilicate alteration, and the uh, black is the serocytic alteration apatite. And you can see that as the mineral become altered, there are some trace I mean, like manganese, sodium, and chlorine. These are depleted progressively as the apatite becomes, becomes altered. And you can actually use this uh, here, okay, here shows the rare earth element as well. So, for example, you can see rare earth elements such as cerium, yttrium. These are also lost during the alteration. So, you can use this chemistry of, of appetite to index the alteration. And here I show rare earth elements against iron, magnesium, manganese to iron ratio, and you can use it. To, to basically characterize the type of, not, not just only saying that this appetite is coming from the porphyry, you can tell it's coming from what type of the alteration in porphyry. And the one, one thing I very quickly I would like to show, these, these kind of samples uh, here, they are coming from the fresh appetite at the margin of the porphyry deposits. And these are quite fresh looking rock around Highland Valley. And there is nothing in those rocks that you can tell and is, uh, tell that is coming from the porphyry deposit, or you are close to a porphyry deposit. But you can see these appetite, which has, they have yellowish luminescence, but it's a little bit going to greenish. It's not quite greenish. And when you look at these appetites, they have lower earth elements. So even the slightest uh, interaction with fluid have affected the raw earth element concentration in appetite. So there is nothing seen in the rock, but appetite has recorded that. And that's, I think, very important in terms of seeing the distal footprint of the porphyry deposit and look at the, look at the geochemistry of appetite. Even the rare earth elements, as you know, have always been known that they are immobile. But within the crystal scale, the rare earth elements are very sensitive to the interaction with fluids. Of course, they don't go very far, and most of these rare earth elements are deposited within or close to the appetite as other minerals such as monazite. So they are immobile, but at the mineral scale are very mobile, and they are in, in use for porphyry. So the other mineral that we looked was titanite, and titanite, we classified the titanite, various type of titanite, magnetic, secondary, uh, and altered titanite, and uh, the, mag the magmatic titanite, as you can see nicely in zone, the secondary titanite could be after augite or biotite or magnetite, and the altered titanite is a titanite which itself been altered. For example, you have overgrowth of rutile and other minerals over the titanite. 
And these have different colors, and that's a very important thing as an easy way to characterize this mineral. The magmatic titanite is commonly colorless. The secondary, a little bit altered, has this blonde color, and, and in rocks with a strong alteration, you can see this dark brownish titanite. And uh, also, geochemistry has the same thing, so the, the uh, fresh titanite has usually uh, intermediate uh, iron to aluminum ratio. When it gets altered, it has higher iron to aluminum ratios and also has less rare earth elements. The, the one they, on grain on the bottom, they are mostly related to the sodic calcic alteration. So they are very similar uh, in terms of rare earth elements to the fresh one, but they have lower iron to aluminum ratio. And this, pic, this diagram shows the vanadium content. And you can see the altered, potentially altered titanite. Uh, the, uh, the open circle shows the analysis at the rim of the appetite. So we analyze up at the center of the appetite and, sorry, titanite and the rim of titanite. And you can see the rim of titanite in the altered rock have uh, significantly higher vanadium. And vanadium is an interesting mineral. So this is just a summary diagram of the titanite alteration index and characterizes various type of uh, titanite, magmatic, when it gets uh, potassically or sodically altered, has layer, less layer element, but with various ratio of the so Uh, just very quickly, the other mineral that we very uh, pilot a study was uh, magnetite and hematite, and these are showing the magnetite is very common mineral in most of the intrusive rock in porphyry deposit. And they are usually have a rim of hematite in calcalic deposit, and we saw a lot of titanite reaming the magnetite in host rock in alkalic deposit. We do, still don't know the detail, but that's just a pure observation. So I looked at the hematite. Uh, so that, that's pretty much uh, in, in fresh rock. In altered rock, the, as you can see, as a result of a strong oxidation, the magnetite is replaced by, by hematite. So the picture on the top shows that uh, in, it's, it's in reflected light, you can see the hematite replacing magnetite. The picture on the bottom, it shows more advanced stage of the hematite replacement. You can see a little bit magnet, blue, uh, pinkish magnetite left. And even though ma magnetite is not considered as a resisted mineral, but when it becomes this texture, there is a lot of silica, quartz, and as a result of uh, alteration of magnetite, you can see there are some rutiles. The picture on the bottom right, it shows the rutile. So these things basically have this sieve texture with a lot of quartz and rutiles, so they make the remaining uh, hematite more resistant. So this is very simply, you can, you can see the texture of the, this thing, suggesting that this thing could come from the porphyry. And we look at the, when you look at the chemistry of these things, you can see the hematite is coming from the altered rock, has higher vanadium. And the vanadium is an interesting mineral. You can see, as you remember from the work in root, uh, rutile and also titanite, and we see it in hematite, it's, it looks like to be vanadium is a good mineral for porphyry deposits. So if you see vanadium. So to, to finish, uh, I would like to conclude that uh, the porphyry indicator mineral seems to have recorded evidence of the porphyry mineralization, and you can look at those things and use it as a new tool, basically, providing new tool to look at these till sediments and look at these various minerals and use it the same way as uh, which been used for kimberlite uh, exploration. And this, this provides a new, this requires the geol exploration geologists uh, have a new 
if you like, a scale of looking at these things. They are very, very, very good to looking at rocks and identifying the various type of alteration, but they need to have the new skill, basically looking at these till sediments, and basically not, not a new thing, looking at using the same knowledge of porphyry alteration and mineralization, and, but identifying evidence of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Farhad, and now we got a 15-minute break.